Interactions between groundwater and surface water are important to both the groundwater and the surface water system. The basic process is that we have recharge coming in here at the uh, VEDA zone and then flow down through the saturated zone and discharge to the stream. So groundwater is discharging up through the stream bed uh, and providing flow to the stream. So the pattern and magnitude of the groundwater discharge can vary and it's affected by a variety of different processes. Um, certainly the hydraulic conductivity of the stream bed is important and the vertical hydraulic head gradient if there are variations in the stage of the stream. So if, the, if there's a flood pulse for example that can cause water to flow back into the uh, bed um, and reverse the flow. Challenge geometry obstructions in the river can change the head in the river and riparian transpiration. So here I show some trees uh, by, the, by the, the side of the river and so we have some transpiration there and that, that can cause uh, some of the groundwater flow and affect the distribution. And so there are a variety of factors affecting the distribution of groundwater discharge and in fact locally there may be groundwater there may be places where groundwater flows out of the stream and the stream is losing so we're interested in how this interaction occurs and we want to see if we can come up with ways to measure it one of the approaches we'll use is to measure the flux directly this will be done with a, a pan and bag type seepage meter we can also estimate the flow by um, determining the hydraulic head gradient and estimating the hydraulic conductivity. So this is a cross-section through a pan and bag seepage meter. This is the pan right here and this is typically a cylindrical device like so and in this diagram it's just cut right down the, the middle and the flow in the stream is going in this direction so there are a couple of uh, different components here this uh, pan on the seepage meter has a protective cover over it this is called a carapace and this causes the flow in the stream to go up and over the pan and that helps pr uh, prevent scouring around the pan. And what's happening here? What's happening here is the groundwater is flowing into the pan, like this. And then there's a hole in the side of the pan. It goes into a tube, and then it's collected here in this flexible bag. And so there's a valve here that allows you to shut off the flow or open the flow. And that'll be convenient because it'll allow you to shut off the flow and close the bag off while you're handling it. There's the collection bag. And around the collection bag, there'll be a rigid container uh, that will prevent the interaction between the bag and the flow here. So this is what's going on. There's groundwater flow going into the pan. It goes along this tube and collects in the bag. So what you do then is measure the volume that has accumulated in the bag over a, cross, over a, a period of time. And the change in volume over change in time is the volumetric flow rate that's coming into this pan here. And then if we have the cross-sectional area of the pan, we divide by that and we get the volumetric flux coming up through the stream bed. So a fairly simple operation. Here's what one of these things looks like. This is a pan formed from a five gallon bucket that's been cut off. There's the cross-sectional area and the flow will go up here. This is uh, this protective carapace and so the flow would be in this direction when the device is installed in the stream. The collection bag is attached to this tube back here. 
And if we look down on this, we can see a top view of the carapace. And this is the collection bag here. And this uh, gray piece is a flexible plastic piece that fits over the collection bag. Here's the valve. Now, this collection bag is uh, a fairly important uh, component of the overall system. The collection bag needs to be strong, yet very flexible. It's, if it's, if it's uh, a thick-walled plastic, like a, like a very heavy gauge um, polyethylene, then the resistance to inflating that bag is enough to cause water to flow around the seepage meter, and that's enough to affect the flow. A student of mine did a paper on this a number of years ago, and um, it, can, it can really be a fairly significant effect. So what you should do is use a bag that is very flexible, very compliant. But the problem with that is that if it's very flexible, then the wall is thin, and it may be prone to leaking. So we've spent quite a bit of time looking around for different types of bags. And this one shown here, we just see the end of it. But this is a bag that's used in the um, used to pack um, boxes uh, that you might want to ship. And uh, it's basically put in the box and inflated inside of the box to prevent things in the box from moving around. So it's uh, from the packing industry. And it's made out of a plastic that's a combination of polyethylene and nylon that's uh, quite a bit stronger than the polyethylene bag that you might recognize, say, in a baggie. So it's a, it's a strong but lightweight bag. And you can't see it in this picture, but it has a, a, an opening uh, that allows you to put a tube and uh, attach a tube to fill it in a convenient way. OK, so here's, here's a look at the inside. And you can see the bag and the filling tube right here. And we put the bag on the tube and then wrap a little bit of tape. Even though these bags are quite strong, they do leak eventually. And so you'd want to be able to replace the bag if you uh, detect any leakage. So this is what it looks like when it's put together. The length of this tube can be varied. Um, and the, you can see how this uh, PVC outer shell would protect the bag from the flow. So here they are deployed. This is a um, seepage meter with the pan exposed and no protective carapace. And you can see how the sediment is building up here. And it's difficult to see, but there's some erosion right around here from eddies that form. And you can see quite a lot of turbulence around the bag. And this is an example with a protective carapace. In this case, the carapace extends all the way back and covers uh, both the pan, the pan is right in here, the pan is right in, right in there, um, and the, the bag, the bag is back here. And this is an opening in the carapace to get access to the, the, the valve to close it so you can pull the bag off securely. So here's a variation on this theme. This is a design that's used for um, deep water. And the uh, seepage meter pan has a handle on it and an extension. So you can push it into the stream bed. And then it has a collection pan or a collection bag here that is uh, attached to a float. So it's floating. You can get access to it. Um, but it's very important that these bags are completely submerged during operation. Um, and so this is, this is submerged. It needs to be submerged, but but not disturbed during the uh, filling process. And so uh, this design will float the bag underneath this this float here and allow you to access this. Um, so it still works in the same way, though the water flows into the pan, up through the tube, and collects in this bag. And then you weigh the bag before and after operations. Mm. So here are some examples of some studies that we've done with the seepage meters. 
This is done on uh, Maple Creek, and uh, it was a study done by Allison Craig, and she put seepage meters um, across the width of this stream, and she did it in many different locations, and then was able to contour up the groundwater discharge. Um, here it's expressed as a flux in centimeters per second. And what she found was that the groundwater discharge, there was some background value. This is kind of a typical value here, I guess in roughly in that range, uh, 0.001 to 002 centimeters per second. Um, but there were some places where the flow was, was quite a bit higher. Um, this location here is uh, right, right associated with this uh, deadfall uh, and this location here is shown here in the stream. It wasn't quite obvious uh, what was causing this high flow, um, although this, this high one was clearly associated with that deadfall. So the way she did this was to make a, a bunch of transects uh, and by doing this, there are seepage meters along these transects like so. And so she developed a series of profiles of groundwater discharge along these individual transects. And then we could get the distribution um, spatially all across the stream bed and could also work out some statistics. So here are the transect numbers and the flux coming into the um, into the stream as a function of distance or as a function of the transect number. And uh, she had quite a few measurements at these individual seepage meters. Each In her study, each seepage meter was measured five times. So we could get statistics on the inflow from each seepage meter. There is a, there is a fair amount of variation from one measurement to the next. But if you practice it, you can get the variation to down to about 30%. And so this, uh, these data here show the um, collection of uh, measurements from several seepage meters along each transect. And you can see this is a, the typical value here with a typical uh, range of um, measurements. And then there are some where the measurements are quite high or, or anomalously high. There are these three transects where it's anomalously high, and it's one or two points along those transects where it's high, and that gives rise to uh, a high average value, but then also a, um, fair, a, a quite a high variability along the transect. So that's the nature of groundwater discharge into the stream. So another thing that can be done is to measure the horizontal head gradient and that's done by pushing a piezometer into a stream bed and then you can you can easily push it in in a sandy stream bed you can push it about a foot down fairly easily and sometimes a good bit deeper than that and then you measure the head difference between the uh, bottom of the piezometer and the stream bed and you take the head difference and divide by the the depth of the piezometer and that gives you the hydraulic head gradient so the way to measure that head difference, it's, it's a fairly small head difference in many cases. And the way to measure that is with a manometer. And a manometer consists of two tubes shown here. And they come up and they're connected together. Um, and so what you do is, uh, if you imagine one of these is attached to the um, piezometer that's down in the stream bed. And the other one is just down at the uh, at the bed of the stream, but in the, the stream itself. And so initially, you fill this up with water completely. And then this is a small valve. You let some air in here, um, or you put in some oil, some vegetable oil. And so there's a, a fluid with a different density than water up here at the top. And what happens then? is, let me go and erase this. What happens if it's filled with oil, or filled with water, and the hydraulic head is greater uh, on the piezometer, 
So if this is greater than this side, then um, the the and there's air in the manometer, then you would have the the air water interface on this side of the manometer would be here, and the air water interface on the other side would be there, and the head difference then would be the difference in these elevations. Now that's the way it works if it's filled with air. If you in, if you fill fill it with water, fill it with oil here, so you've got this filled with oil, then you get an amplification of the head difference, and this is the amplification factor. So vegetable oil has a density of about 0.9, and if you do this calculation, the um, this gives you an amplification factor of 10. So if this is filled with vegetable oil, then this head difference here, this difference in elevation, is 10 times the head difference between this point and this point. Okay, so that allows you to amplify the head difference and it allows you to measure some very, very small head differences. What we do is to go in here and measure this difference with a, a caliper. And a caliper allows you to fairly accurately measure uh, differences in head of, say, 20 or 30 thousandths of an inch. Um, and so if you can do that, with the caliper and you have this factor of 10 magnification then you can measure head differences of two or three thousandths that's about the thickness of a piece of paper so this is just a very simple inexpensive instrument but it allows you to measure very very small head differences here's a schematic of what's happening with this uh, this particular device Here's the piezometer, and here's the open part of the piezometer, and it's pushed in the stream bed. And this is the manometer, this, this tubing here. And this is a valve. And this fluid is, the gray area here is this alternative fluid, either air or some kind of a oil that's some kind of a fluid that, that doesn't mix with the water and has some density difference. So what you can do with this measurement, you can determine the hydraulic head gradient. And in a simple way, you can tell whether the water is flowing upwards or downwards, just based on the sign of the gradient. In this case, the, the hydraulic head at this point in the stream bed is greater than it is down here at, at depth. So this would be a situation where the groundwater was flowing downward. So we can get a sense of whether this is an area where the groundwater is discharging, uh, f going from groundwater to the stream, or going the other way from the stream to the groundwater. We could get the magnitude of the flux from uh, the vertical head gradient and from uh, a stream bed slug test. So we can conduct a slug test in the stream bed, use that to estimate the hydraulic conductivity, and then just use Darcy's law to estimate what the flux is. So another thing that can be done is to use this manometer. Once it's set up, it's, um, it, it's a, a nice little tool to try measuring the velocity head. And the way that's done is to set the manometer up like this. So one end of it is pointing upstream and the other is pointing perpendicular to the flow. And if you do that, the head difference measured like this is equal to V squared over 2G. That's the velocity head. So if we measure delta H, and then we can determine what the velocity is using that formula. So, for example, if um, delta H is, uh, let's say it's one centimeter, then we can determine the velocity like this. That would be equal to 0 0.01 
meter. So let's see, 0 0.01 meter times 2 times g, which is 10 meters per second squared. Okay, so that's going to be 10 times 10 times 0 0.1 times 2. That looks like 0 0.2. And the units here are meters squared per second squared. So need to take the square root of that and because that's what this formula tells us. And let's see. So the velocity, it looks like it will be the square root of 0.2, which is 0 0.44 meters per second. OK, so if I get a velocity head of 1 centimeter, then that corresponds to a, a velocity of 0.44 meters per second. So I can use this simple manometer as a, a flow meter. This is a, a essentially functioning like a pitot tube flow meter. 